Now with this talk we come probably to the most controversial part. I get into a lot of hot water over this one, namely the subject of baptism. Uh, it is probably the hottest issue connected with being born again in every part of the church, not just those that are baptizing babies, but even those who are baptizing believers often have real difficulty in seeing where baptism fits into salvation, seeing where it fits into being born again, seeing where it fits into entering eternal life here and now. There are many, for example, who even when believers are baptized, don't realize that what God is doing in that act and see only the human side. Uh, some see it of it as a wet witness kind of thing, or some others simply as an act of obedience. And you'd be amazed how many pastors of believer baptizing denominations that I speak to who can't answer the question, what is God doing for a believer when they're baptized? They see it purely as a human act. I was speaking on this once and there was a dear lady from Trinidad in the congregation who was obviously used to joining in sermons, if you know what I mean. Preach it, brother, preach it, brother. But she shouted out, as a Methodist, as dry cleaned. And I said, Madam, I like your humor, but I don't like your theology. <laughs> right, let's get down to this thing called baptism then. Have to give you a bit of history, first of all. Where did it all start? As far as the Bible is concerned, it started with John the Plunger. That's what the word Baptist means. It means John the Plunger, or John the Dipper, or John the Soaker, or John the Drencher. That's all it meant. It, it wasn't spelt with a capital B, and it simply means someone who plunged someone else into something. And so he got the nickname of John the Plunger, or in our terms, John the Baptist or literally John the Baptizer. Now as far as we know, nobody else had done it before him. Nevertheless, right from the dawn of history, it is a fact that when people feel dirty inside, they invariably wash the outside. Pilate, when he tried to get rid of his guilt, for condemning Jesus to death, called for a bowl of water and said, I wash my hands of this innocent man. And he was doing in a physical way something that actually was trying to get rid of his dirt on the inside, the guilt on his conscience. Any psychiatrist would tell you of people who get so ridden with guilt that they're forever washing their hands, forever taking a bath, Men, when they've committed an act of immorality, often like to go and take a shower, if only to try and feel a bit cleaner. So from time immemorial, there has been a ritual meaning to washing in water, and not just a physical. In fact, in a Middle Eastern marriage to this day, in a Muslim marriage, the bridegroom is taken by his friends, not for a stag party, but they take him and give him a bath wash away all his bachelorhood and to present him clean to the bride so that washing in water for other than a physical cleansing is not unknown in human society. Indeed in the Old Testament the Levitical priests would two things were done to them when they were consecrated for the priesthood. They were washed in water and anointed with oil. Now in the New Covenant all believers are priests. So all believers have those two things, a washing in water and an anointing. And these are the two steps we're now to consider in this talk and the next. So to be consecrated as the priest that we now are, the priesthood of all believers, we also have a washing in water and an anointing, not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit, who is represented by oil. But that's the next talk. There is also a possibility, and it's only a possibility, we don't have clear evidence yet, that even before John the Baptist, a Gentile who wanted to become part of the Jewish people was circumcised and baptized. And many have argued that John was simply 
copying what's called proselyte baptism of the Jews. If so, then his baptism must have been very offensive because he was saying to the Jewish people, you need to be baptized. Whereas if the Jews had already been using it on Gentiles, he was treating the Jews as Gentiles and saying you don't belong to God's people at all. Well, we don't know for sure whether John got it from anyone else or simply direct from the Lord. We do know that what he was doing was baptizing people into repentance. Now it says he baptized people in water into repentance. Now that word into is as important as the word in because it tells you something. Here is John the Baptist. He says, I will baptize you in water into repentance. Therefore, you must be in repentance before I baptize you into repentance. Now stay with me. This is a very important point. He says, you produce fruits worthy of repentance and I'll baptize you into repentance so that the baptism in water was doing something to the repentance they were already in, bringing it to a climax and a completion, a consummation. That's what baptism does. It brings what you are already in to its climax and consummation. So he says, you must already be in repentance. If you are, then I will baptize you into repentance. In English, we would have usually to say right into it. It's as if I, as a pastor, said to a couple, you prove to me you're in love and I will marry you into love. Marriage doesn't start the love, but it brings it to a consummation, a climax, a, a completion so that a couple may be in love long before they're married, but the marriage ceremony and the physical consummation of it brings that love to its complete expression. Do you follow me? That's the significance of into. Into in English usually means the first introduction to something, but in the Greek it means to be brought right into something so that I may already be repenting of my sins, but baptism in water brings that repentance to its completion. A final settlement, a final break with the old life. I may already be believing in Jesus, but baptism brings me into the consummation of that faith by so identifying me with his death and burial and resurrection that that has settled it. Are you beginning to understand what baptism does? It doesn't of itself mark the beginning of repentance and faith, but it brings both to their consummation, to their completion, by doing something, by God doing something for the believer. Well now, Jesus picked up the practice of baptism from John, or rather his disciples did it. Jesus himself never baptized, and Simon Peter took the cue from Jesus, and Peter later refused to baptize himself, as Paul later refused to baptize. And do you know why they did? Because they didn't want the focus to be on the baptizer. Do you follow me? It doesn't matter who baptizes you. That's not the point. And so Jesus wouldn't do it, so nobody could say, I had a better baptism than you, Jesus baptized me. And Peter wouldn't baptize Cornelius. He told others to, so that Cornelius would never say, I had Simon Peter baptize me. If you ever say, Mr. So-and-so baptized me, you've misunderstood the whole thing. In fact, some of you here from churches where I've been pastor know that I always baptized with someone else, so that two of us did it, so that nobody could say, he baptized me. The important thing is not the person, it's the act. It became, of course, part of the missionary mandate, and the early church baptized everyone. There was no such thing in the early church as an unbaptized Christian. It would have been a contradiction in terms. How could someone say, I've accepted Jesus as Lord, if they haven't done the first thing he told them? It's just nonsense. 
How can someone say, I believe in Jesus, when they don't obey him? It's nonsense. The very first thing Jesus told his disciples to do was to be baptized. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. You begin the very first act of repentance and faith in the Christian life is to be baptized. The very first act of trust and obedience is to be baptized. And it would have been astonishing to the apostles in the New Testament that people could consider themselves disciples of Jesus without it, because that's the very first expression of your repentance and faith. Now, how was baptism done in the New Testament? Well, they ducked them. <laughs> the word baptize itself is a Greek word, and it means only one thing. I've written down all its meanings. There are a whole lot of meanings in English that begin with the letter D and a whole lot with the letter S. Here they are. Drench, dip, duck, dunk, douse, deluge. And here are the S's. Soak, sink, swamp, steep, saturate. Those are all the English words that correspond to the single Greek word baptizo, from which we get our word baptize. I'll tell you something now which you probably don't know and which will shock you. It was written into the Bible Society regulations. I have seen them. I was sent a copy of them three months ago. That whenever the scriptures were translated into English, the word baptizine must not be translated into English. Would you believe that? We're the only language in the world that can't have all the scriptures in our own tongue. Because if it were translated with any of the words I've mentioned, so many church people would be upset. Isn't that tragic? So the word is transliterated. I mean by that it's simply spelt in English letters. It's not translated. So baptizine becomes baptize instead of becoming drench, dip, soak, plunge. But John the Baptist was John the plunger, John the dipper. Don John the Soaker, that was his nickname. And incidentally, we shall see in the next talk that the same nickname was given to Jesus. Did you know Jesus was a Baptist? In John's Gospel, he's given the same title, Jesus the Plunger, except that he doesn't plunge people in water, he plunges people in the Holy Spirit. It's the same title, same word. But we've got more evidence in the Bible than that. We have, for example, a verse in John 3, did you know that John 3 tells you how much water to use in Christian baptism? Amazing how many people know John 3.16 and they don't know John 3.23 which says John was baptizing near Enon in Salim or in Salim near Enon, I forget which way round it is, because there was much water there. Now, if you understand plain English, you couldn't have it put more plainly than that. They had to choose somewhere where there was much water. We also have Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. It says he went down into the water and came up out of the water. Nothing could be clearer. To this day, the Greek Orthodox Church, they know Greek, always immerse babies. I was fascinated to watch the immersion of a baby in a Greek Orthodox church on television. That poor little naked thing was immersed three times in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Spirit. That was the end of the service for all practical purposes. You could not worship from then on. That baby objected furiously. If it had had any language, it would have objected theologically, but it was, it was objecting in the only way it knew how. But the interesting thing is, the Greeks would never sprinkle water on a baby. That would make nonsense to the Greek language. How can you immerse by sprinkling? How can you plunge by sprinkling? They would say, it's nonsense, because they know Greek. They know the original word. And until comparatively recently, all babies in Britain were immersed. You look at the size of the font in a medieval church. Have you ever noticed? Did you think they had bigger babies in those days?
No, they plunged them, they dipped them, they still knew the meaning of the word. Now we've almost lost the meaning of the word. Now why should it be so important to be in water than have water on you? I'll tell you why. Because baptism in the New Testament has a double meaning. It has the cleansing meaning. It has the meaning of being a bath. It also has the meaning of being a burial. And the two things that baptism means in the New Testament, it is a bath for those who are dirty, and it is a burial for those who are dead. Now, sprinkling water on a person may communicate the meaning of the bath, but it doesn't communicate the meaning of the burial. Being immersed in water, out of sight, under, is a burial as well as a bath. And it is these two meanings that are brought together in Scripture. It's not just a sign of cleansing, it's a sign of being buried. So putting those two together, Jesus commanded us to plunge people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's of course what they did. From the day of Pentecost onwards, it was assumed that a person responding to the Gospel would start with a bath and a burial rolled into one with the most common material or medium available on earth, namely water. I have heard of places where the water hasn't been available. In parts of India, in drought, they dig a hole in the ground, they line it with a white cotton sheet, they lay the person in it, cover them as with a shroud and sprinkle precious water on the shroud till the shroud is wet and they can do it with about a pint that's all they've got i'm sure the lord understands but the normal way to be baptized is to be bathed and buried and that the word itself indicates is done by immersion by being plunged soaked saturated washed away but there's more to it than that why was it done if you read the New Testament, there are 31 passages which tell you why they baptize people. And in almost every case, the answer is not in terms of what man is doing for the Lord, but what the Lord will do for people in the baptism. The emphasis, hear this carefully, the emphasis is on instrumental language. The New Testament doesn't treat baptism as a symbol, but as an event. The New Testament talks of what it's for, what it will achieve, what it effects. And when you read those passages, they are astonishing. Let me run through a few. Mark 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Here is the word saved directly linked to baptism, which is astonishing. Take John 3. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? He can't get back into his mummy's tummy and come out again. How can he be born again? And Jesus said, no, you don't have to come out of mummy's tummy to be born again. You need to be born again out of water and spirit. And the interesting thing is he uses the word out of, which means you've got to get into something to come out of it. New life comes out of water, out of spirit. And yet, as I told you earlier, I've heard so many sermons on you must be born again, not one of which explained what the word water meant. Nicodemus, I have no doubt, understood that Jesus was criticizing him as a Pharisee for refusing John's baptism of repentance, for that was his condition. And most commentators through the ages have seen in John 3, 5, a reference to water baptism. The joy of just being able to take God's word as it stands. When God says water, he means water. That's all. And whenever you find the word water in John's gospel, it means water. If it ever means anything else, he qualifies it with an adjective like living water. Then you know that's not water. But when he says water, it's water. When he says Jesus changed water into wine, he means water. 
and he didn't mean Ribena, he meant wine, but it was water. And when it says, John says, I baptize in water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it means water. And when it says John was baptized, baptizing at Enon near Salim, because there was much water there, he means water. Whenever you read water, it means water. Don't try and make the Word of God difficult for yourself. Jesus says, born out of water and spirit. And we know what spirit means, we know what water means. Move on. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when they said, what must we do? It says he told them many other things. We don't have the record of all he counseled them over. I'm sure he counseled them in the four things I'm telling you about. But he said, repent and be baptized, each one of you be plunged, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what it's for. Later, Saul of Tarsus met the risen Jesus on the Damascus Road. Three days later, a dear old man called Ananias came and said, Brother Saul, took a, a lot of grace to say that, Brother Saul, what are you waiting for? Rise and be plunged and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So it goes on all the way through the New Testament. Ephesians 5, Paul says that Jesus has cleansed, cleansed his church by the washing of water with the word. The washing of water, and that means water. Or Hebrews 10 says, let us approach his throne with full assurance of faith, having our bodies washed with clean water and our consciences sprinkled. Sprinkle your conscience, but have your body washed in clean water. It's as plain as daylight. I think the, the most startling statement is Peter. In Peter's letter, he says this, listen, baptism now saves you, not by washing dirt from your body, but by an appeal to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus from the, bed, from the dead. Listen, baptism now saves you. And the word saves there means what it means everywhere else. And yet still the majority of Christians can't relate baptism to salvation. Isn't that amazing? And the most frequent question I get asked is, must you be baptized to be saved? Well, how often does the word of God have to say it before we'll believe it? Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter says, baptism now saves you. This is 1 Peter 3.21. Not by washing dirt from your body, but by an appeal to God for a clean conscience. All the apostles treat baptism as an event in which God is doing something. And they liken it to events connected with water in the Old Testament where God also did something for his people. Paul, for example, says that baptism is like the crossing of the Red Sea to the Jew. Now, what was it to the Jew to cross the Red Sea? It says when the Jews crossed the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses. Now, they were already following Moses for three days. So it didn't start their following of Moses. What it did, it brought them to the climax where Pharaoh was left on the other shore. And they had only one boss, now Moses. As long as they were the other side of the water, they were in Pharaoh's reach. But what crossing the Red Sea was to the Jew in relation to Pharaoh, baptism is to the Christian in relation to Satan. Romans 6 says that once you've been buried, with Christ in baptism, sin has no more dominion. You're on the right shore of the Red Sea. You are literally delivered from the territory of Satan. Now that makes baptism a deliverance. And I want you to realize that a lot of Christians wouldn't need a ministry of deliverance if they saw what their baptism had actually done. Can you understand what I'm saying? As Pharaoh's troops were drowned in the water of baptism, Satan's demons are drowned in the waters of baptism. And sin has no more dominion over you. 
you can actually say, Satan, go to hell, you're talking to a dead person. You attended my funeral. That's where burial comes in. It marks the final goodbye. I have taken many funerals in my time, only one in the last eight years, but before that I took many, and I have sometimes gone to a house of a widow, and she greets me at the door before the funeral, and she says this, Hello, Mr. Pawson, uh, come in. Would you like to see my husband? He is in the front room. What a strange way to talk, isn't it? I go into the front room, and there he lies, and she'll pat his head and fluff the pillow up and kiss his forehead as if he's still there. Then we go to the funeral and we come back from the cemetery for the ham tea and over the ham sandwich she says to me another thing. She says, Mr. Pawson, my husband was a good man to me. Now why before the funeral did she say he is in the front room? And after the funeral, he was a good man. I'll tell you why, because the burial is the final end of a life. It's not the death that ends your relationship, it's the burial. You know you'll never see them again, never touch them again, that's it. That's why the families of the Lockerbie disaster and the Piper Rig disaster wanted the bodies so that they could properly say goodbye. It is right to have a funeral. But after that, you know, that is it. I have no further relationship. And of course, marriage is only for this world. It's not renewed in the next. It's till death us do part. So the burial is the final goodbye to the old life. That is why Satan hates baptism, because he knows that's the burial. When my wife and I were in Arabia, when Muslims got baptized, they signed their death warrant. They were murdered, they were knifed, they were poisoned. Some had their homes burnt down with their families inside. The Muslims didn't mind them coming to church, reading their Bibles, saying they were Christians, but when they got baptized, they knew that's the end. We can't touch them now. Satan knows that too. Peter likened it to Noah's flood. He said, just as the water of Noah's flood marked the complete end of the world he'd lived in and brought him through to a new beginning, so baptism does for you. It is a bath and a burial. And some of you must have heard me talk about a young man who lives only a mile or two from our present home. And when he came to Christ a few years ago, he was a hell's angel. And he'd been into all kinds of things he shouldn't have touched. And he knew that the first thing he should do was to get baptized. But he didn't want to be baptized because he was covered with tattoos. And he noticed that church people didn't go in for tattoos much. And he knew that your shirt went transparent in the water. So he went to a plastic surgeon and he said, could you get this tattoo off my body? Because one of his tattoos was a picture of the devil which he'd had done as a hell's angel. And he couldn't face being baptized and letting Christians see the devil on his body. So he said to the plastic surgeon, could you get this off? And the surgeon said, not on the national health, that's cosmetic surgery. It'll cost you a few hundred pounds and take months. He said, I could burn it off, but that leaves a scar. He said, uh, what we normally do is to graft some skin from another part of your body to replace that skin. And the boy said, well, I haven't the money and I haven't the time. So he went and asked a friend of mine to baptize him. I think he was baptized in a swimming pool. He went down in the water to bury his past, to wash his sins away. And when he came up out of the water, one to two had gone. Just one, not the rest, just that one had gone. In that water, H2O, God had washed the devil off his child. God wasn't going to have the mark of Satan on that child. Now, if you tell that boy that baptism is only a symbol, I think he'll laugh in your face. He saw it as a deliverance. And just as every Jew to this day celebrates Passover and remembers the mighty hand of God getting them through the water of the Red Sea, so a Christian looks back to the day of his funeral. I have a friend, a pastor, who when he baptizes people says, now it's your funeral, enjoy it. You can throw that funeral in Satan's face forever afterwards. I've been buried, 
and as sure as Jesus was buried, I've been buried. When Jesus came out of that grave, he had no more contact with Pilate, no more with Satan, no more with Annas and Caiaphas. He was out of their reach. Nobody can touch him now. And nobody can touch you. You can call Satan's bluff and say, I have been crucified with Christ. I've been buried with Christ. I've been raised with Christ. You see, being a Christian is not just saying, I believe he was crucified for me. It is to be able to say, I have been crucified with him. It's not just enough to say, I believe he was buried for me. I need to be able to say, I have been buried with him. It's not just enough to say, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. We need to be able to say, I've been raised to a new life. In other words, those historical facts on which our faith is based need to become my own experience and history so that I now know them to be true because they've happened to me. I know he was crucified because I've been crucified. I know he was buried because in his name I've been buried. I know he was raised because the same power that raised him from the dead is now mine. Which brings us to the fourth topic, but I'll leave it till the next talk. Now when we talk like this, I get all kinds of reactions to this view of baptism. And the two most frequent questions I get asked are first, what about baptismal regeneration? That's a real bogey to some Christians. I'll explain what it means in a moment. And the other, what about infant baptism? So I better say a little about these two things, but I will also say that there's a whole appendix in this book on infant baptism in which I try and show how it arose, why it arose, how to handle it today, and so on. And I haven't time now to go into it. I will just have to be totally honest and say that in my understanding of the normal Christian birth in the New Testament, I cannot fit infant baptism into that understanding. I'm sorry. I know that offends many Christians, but I just cannot fit it in. I'll tell you why. I cannot apply the New Testament meaning of baptism to babies. It's not the practice I'm concerned about, it's the significance. If baptism is a bath for dirty people, how can it be a bath for a baby who's not yet dirty? If baptism is a burial for someone who's dead, how can it be given to a baby who's not dead? There is no point in baptism until someone is dirty and dead. And the trouble is, if you apply New Testament teaching on baptism to babies, you either are left with a superstitious or magic understanding of what's going on, or you have to make it a pure symbol that doesn't do anything. And that's a trap that we shouldn't get ourselves into. So I'm being very frank there. It was an astonishing discovery to me that all the Protestant reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, all of them, when they rediscovered the truth of justification by faith, realized that that was totally incompatible with baby baptism. How can a person be justified by faith when they're old enough to believe, and yet also saved by baptism as a baby. It just doesn't tie up. And would you believe it, all those reformers advocated openly, I've quoted them carefully in my book, all of them said, we must return to believers' baptism. They even called baby baptism wicked and a gross profanity. And yet, none of them return to believers' baptism. That's the astonishing thing that happened three or four hundred years ago. They realized the truth, but they didn't practice it, which raises the question, why did they not practice what they preached? And the answer, alas, is only too simple, because all of them set up state churches. And you can't have a state church that practices believers' baptism because a state church 
must welcome into its membership all citizens born in the state. Now you see the problem. So though they advocated believers' baptism, they realized that they couldn't have state churches and believers' baptism, and they all settled for some kind of state church in which a baby born into the state had to be welcomed into the church. So that in a sense, I believe the Reformation was never complete. And we were left with a medieval practice of Christendom, a word which combines church and state, from which we haven't got free yet. The truth is that two out of every three citizens in the United Kingdom have been christened as babies, two out of every three. The truth also is that over the whole world, it's about 50-50, and there is a swing over the whole world back to believers' baptism. Even within the state churches, there is now a published list of Anglican churches that have got pools available for baptism by immersion. So I believe it's only a matter of time, but I wish we could get a move on. And the most worrying thing to me is this, that many thousands who make a decision or a commitment, as we say, at a Billy Graham crusade or at any big mission like that, at the very moment they most need a bath and a burial, they're told you can't have it because you've been christened. Now I think that's robbing them of a vital means of grace. It's robbing them of part of the new birth. And I believe it's time for us to go back to the Bible in honesty and say, can we apply the meaning of New Testament baptism to babies? My answer is no, we can't. If baptism actually is for the forgiveness of sins, what's that got to do with a baby? If baptism is for the washing away of your sins, what's that got to do with a baby? Listen, baptism has nothing to do with getting you out of hell and everything to do with getting you cleaned up. I remember when I baptized Cliff Richard and he wrote in his autobiography a very vivid description, free of all jargon. He said, David Pawson washed me, rinsed me and hung me up to dry. And I never felt so clean in all my life. You do feel clean inside and out. God is bringing your forgiveness to its consummation, bringing your repentance to its consummation, bringing your faith to its climax. As a marriage brings the love between two people to its consummation, which is yet the beginning of the marriage, so baptism brings my repentance and my faith to its climax. I can't apply any of that to a baby. Just can't fit it in. In other words, People who ask me then, what about baptismal regeneration? That's a phrase for the belief that baptism of itself saves. It grew up in the days when people honestly believed that a baby was being saved from hell by being christened. And that belief is still around when we didn't have our three children christened. Relatives were saying, but what if the baby dies? And we could only say, but what if it does die? If God was the kind of God who'd send my baby to hell because it hadn't had a few drops of water and a magic formula set over it, I couldn't love that God. That God's an arbitrary tyrant. People say, well, what happens to unbaptized babies? Same thing that happens to baptized babies. What happens to them then? I don't know. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell me what happens to a baby that dies. So what do we say to a mother or a father when a baby dies? We say this, or well, this is what I say. Listen, when you know God as well as I do, you'll know that whatever he does with your baby is absolutely right. You're called now to trust him. He has not told us what he does. He has told us to trust him to do what's right. That, I believe, is what we should say. We should not give false comfort or make up anything that's not in God's Word. He has seen fit not to tell us, but he's told us to trust him. 
Now, baptismal regeneration is the belief that baptism of itself, the right words and a bit of water, saves a person. I do not believe that. I don't even believe in baptismal regeneration of believers. What I do believe is that in the context of a penitent believer coming into that water, that water is a means of grace and is going to have a spiritual effect on them by bringing their forgiveness, their cleansing, their break with the old life to its climax and consummation and is part of their being saved, not from hell, but from their sins, part of enabling them to live a clean, righteous life here. I'll be saying more about this in the very last talk, but I believe we've got to get away from a gospel that talks about being safe from hell and into the New Testament gospel of being salvaged from our sins. If you're only interested in being safe from hell, you will not see what baptism does for you or how it fits in. If you're concerned to be cleaned up from your sins, you will see this as God's amazing offer of his grace to start you clean. And the next talk we'll talk about the other baptism which every believer needs to live right. And that's the baptism in the Holy Spirit.